Okay, in our video series of Neurology Lectures, in this video we are going to talk about amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. A 21-year-old PhD student comes to the clinic complaining of difficulty performing fine motor tasks like writing, like buttoning up the shirt. Over the next few months, patients developed difficulty walking, difficulty talking, difficulty swallowing food. Slowly and gradually, the patient becomes wheelchair-bound, cannot use his body, cannot perform the daily life activities. This person was none other than the very famous renowned physicist Stephen Hawking. He could not talk. He used a simple cheek muscle. That simple cheek muscle was uh, converted into speech by this assistive technology. It reminds me of the quote that he said, However difficult life may seem, there is always something you can do and succeed at. Stephen Hawking suffered from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. ALS is also called as Louis Gehrig disease because a famous baseball player also suffered from this disease. So in this video, we are going to talk about amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also called as Louis Gehrig disease. How does it present? How do you diagnose it? How do you manage it? Today, we are going to talk about that. Basically, in Louis Gehrig disease, both upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron damage takes place. Now, most of the neurology diseases, what you would see is that the patient will either have upper motor neuron damage as it happens in stroke patients or the patients have lower motor neuron injury like it happens in GBS patients. But if you see both both of the signs and symptoms, signs and symptoms of upper motor neuron damage as well as lower motor neuron damage, that is ALS. It starts asymmetrically, it involves one side of the body much more as compared to the other side and the mean age of the patients usually is 65 years, but it can also involve younger patients as well. Now coming to the causes of ALS. In 5 to 10 percent of the cases there is a family history the patients have in any other person in the family that has been affected by ALS and now the patient has developed ALS but in majority of the cases in 90 to 95 percent of the cases there is no family history and it happens on its own that is called as a sporadic disease now if a patient has familial disease there are some genetic mutations that are involved that cause this familial inherited pattern that is SOD1 mutation, superoxide dismutase mutation. Basically, superoxide dismutase is an enzyme that blocks these superoxide radicals that are formed from oxygen. These free radicals damage the body. So, superoxide dismutase neutralizes those radicals. But whenever there is any mutation in superoxide dismutase, the superoxide dismutase is not working and it cannot uh, neutralize those free radicals. When the free radicals are not neutralized, these free radicals would damage the neurons. These will damage the upper motor neurons. These will damage the lower motor neurons. What is upper motor neuron? What is lower motor neuron? I'll also discuss about that when we come to the clinical presentation section. There are some other mutations that are also involved, but the most important one is SOD1 mutation that you have to remember for your exams. Now, there are certain environmental risk factors that you need to know that increase the risk of developing ALS. Exposure to pesticides, exposure to substances containing beta and methyl amino L alanine, lead, head trauma can cause ALS. US military has been shown to have increased risk of ALS and it is specific to US military. It has not been seen in British or French militaries. In specifically US military, there is a higher chances of uh, these soldiers to develop ALS. Smoking exposes the patient to ALS. Now to understand amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, you need to understand what upper motor neuron and what lower motor neuron means. Basically, all the neurons that are present in the brain and the spinal cord are called as upper motor neurons. And all the neurons that arise from the spinal cord and then innervate the muscles and the organs are called as lower motor neurons. Now, whenever there is injury to the upper motor neurons, that presents in a certain way, that presents with a specific signs and symptoms. If there is injury to the upper motor neuron, neurons that are present in the uh, brain or the spinal cord, these patients will have hyper reflex. When you check the reflexes, the reflexes will be exaggerated and the, the tone will be high, the muscle tone, there will be rigidity, hypertonia in these patients. Now you would be thinking that why is there hyper reflexia and hypertonia? Basically, whenever you check a reflex, tendon reflex, normally the tendon reflex, when you hit the tendon with the tendon hammer, that reflex goes 
to the spinal cord and comes out to the lower motor neuron and causes the muscle contraction but this reflex is modulated by these upper motor neurons these upper motor neurons provide certain inhibitory signals to this reflex so that the reflex is not very strong so that the reflex is not exaggerated when you hit the tendon hammer the upper motor neurons control this reflex and the upper motor neuron would not let the reflex to be exaggerated or very brisk but whenever there is injury to the upper motor neurons what happens is that when you hit this tendon with the tendon hammer the reflex is very brisk and exaggerated because there is loss of inhibitory signals due to the upper motor neuron damage therefore you will see hyper reflexia in these patients and similarly uh, there is a certain amount of muscle tone that is present all the time and that is because of this uh, this circuit but this circuit is inhibited by the upper motor neurons so that the, the muscles don't go into severe spasm but whenever there is upper motor neuron damage that inhibitory signal is lost and the tone of the muscle at rest will be increased therefore you will see hypertonia so it's basically the inhibitory signals from the upper motor neurons that are lost and these lower circuits these lower synapses become hyperactive these reflexes at the lower levels become hyperactive therefore you will see hyperreflexia hypertonia in upper motor neuron lesions now what will happen if you cut off these nerves if you damage the lower motor neuron if you damage the lower motor neuron now the muscles are not receiving any innervation when the muscles are not receiving any innervation you will not be able to see any reflex in these patients because they do not have any connection to the main circuit they do not have any connection with the spinal cord now in upper motor neuron it was the damage in the upper part but there was a circuit that was present over here in lower motor neuron you are totally cutting off the muscle from the central nervous system therefore you will not see any reflex there will be hyporeflexia the tone will be absent there will be hypotonia and these there you will see fasciculations in these patients basically fasciculations are the twitching of the muscle so these twitchings take place due to the intrinsic activity of the muscles this is not because of any neural uh, excitation from the nerves this is just a basic intrinsic muscle activity that you see twitches a slight twitching in the muscle that is called as fasciculation that is also a lower motor neuron sign and when these muscles are not being used because they are not being innervated therefore you will see muscle at so use it or lose it if these muscles are not being used you will lose them therefore you will see atrophy now the interesting feature in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is that you will find both upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron injuries in these patients these patients will be having upper motor neuron signs in some parts of the body and in the other parts of the body you will see lower motor neuron signs this is what makes this disease different from others because most of these neurology diseases you will either see upper motor neuron signs or you see lower motor neuron signs but if in a clinical scenario you see both of these signs and symptoms both upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron symptoms you should think about ALS now what are the areas that are damaged in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis the upper motor neuron injury mainly takes place in precentral gyrus and prefrontal cortex this is a picture showing precentral gyrus and this area is the prefrontal gyrus this is mainly damaged in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis now coming to lower motor neuron lower motor neuron injury occurs in the anterior horn of the spinal cord very important very high yield point basically this is the spinal cord and lower motor neurons arise from here so whenever there is damage to the anterior horn of the spinal cord at the level what you will see is that the lower motor neuron won't function therefore there will be a lower motor neuron injury so in the upper motor neuron it was the precentral gyrus and prefrontal cortex that was being damaged in the lower motor neurons it's basically the anterior part of this spinal cord that is being damaged now coming to the clinical presentation when you understand the basic physiologies it's pretty easy for you to understand the clinical presentation every sign and symptom would make sense to you because you would know what is happening at the back of that symptoms to learn medicine it's very important that you know why and how that symptom is coming to me because when you understand the everything that is happening at the back of the symptoms it becomes very easy for you to diagnose a patient and treat the patient 
Now in the clinical presentation, what you would see is that there will be asymmetric limb weakness. As I told you, ALS usually presents asymmetrically. Split hand sign. In split hand sign, atrophy of the thinner muscles takes place. The thinner muscles are atrophied and you will see loss of the thinner eminence. That is a sign seen in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Now coming to bulbar palsy and pseudobulbar palsy. Basically, bulbar palsy is a lower motor neuron injury to cranial nerve 9, 10, 11, 12. Now, if you know the function of these nerves, it becomes very easy to understand the symptoms. These cranial nerves are mainly involved in speech articulation as well as swallowing food. So these patients with bulbar palsy will have injury to these nerves and have difficulty swallowing food and difficulty speech articulation. What you will see in these patients that they, these, these patients will have a nasal speech, a flaccid speech because they cannot articulate the muscles properly. Now, in contrast, the patients of pseudobulbar palsy, pseudobulbar palsy also affects this area, these very nerves, but it causes upper motor neuron damage. So the damage is upper motor neuron damage. Therefore, these patients have, these patients also have difficulty articulating speech. These patients also have difficulty swallowing food, but these patients will have more strained speech, more rigid speech as compared to bulbar palsy, which has a nasal speech. With that, in patients with pseudobulbar palsy, there will be exaggerated jaw jerk reflex. The jaw jerk is tested and that jaw jerk is usually absent in normal people. This jaw jerk reflex will be exaggerated, which makes sense. The gag reflex will be exaggerated in these patients, while in the other hand, the gag reflex will be absent in bulbar palsy. The jaw jerk reflex will be absent in bulbar palsy because it is a lower motor neuron injury and pseudobulbar palsy is an upper motor neuron injury. What is pseudobulbar effect? Basically, pseudobulbar palsy also affects the mood of the patient. There is emotional lability in these patients with pseudobulbar palsy that also makes it different from bulbar palsy. So patients with pseudobulbar palsy will have certain episodes of laughter, certain episodes of crying. That is also a part of pseudobulbar palsy and that is called as pseudobulbar effect. Now these patients of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis will have weight loss because there is muscle atrophy going on. These patients will have fasciculations. Fasciculations when the lower motor neurons are damaged, the nerves, the muscles are not innervated now and the muscles start twitching on their own. That is the intrinsic twitching, the intrinsic activity of the muscles that results in fasciculation, a lower motor neuron sign. Clonus. What is clonus? Basically, whenever you dorsiflex a patient's foot in the upper motor neuron injury, what you will see is there will be episodes of rhythmic contraction and relaxation of the muscles and you would see the foot jerking like this. That is seen in upper motor neuron injury. Now, I will show you a video in which you will see how the clonus appears. Now, as soon as the patient's foot is dorsiflexed, you will see the rhythmic contraction of the muscles. See the rhythmic contraction of the muscles that is an upper motor neuron sign. So clonus can be seen in these patients. You will see hyperreflexia, you may see spasticity. All of these are the upper motor neuron signs. Fasciculations is a lower motor neuron sign. Pseudobulbar palsy is upper motor neuron. Bulbar palsy is lower motor neuron. Slowly and gradually, these patients experience dysphagia, respiratory failure. And remember an important point about ALS, a very important point, a something that if they give you an exam, a scenario with upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron signs and symptoms, and they say that the disease spares the bowel, bladder and sexual function. They are talking about ALS straight away. Click ALS because that is the correct option. ALS somehow spares the bowel, bladder and sexual functions. Therefore, these patients will have a family life and it does not involve bowel and bladder. In the very later stages, it can involve the bladder as well, but ALS generally spares these. ALS also spares the sensory pathways, so the sensations of the patients will be normal. These patients will not have come to you with sensory complaint because it spares the dorsal column and spinothalamic tract that run in the upper part of the spinal cord because it mainly involves the anterior aspect and it spares the dorsal aspects. That is why it is also called as motor neuron disease because it spares the sensory pathways and it mainly affects the motor aspect of the nervous system.
Now coming to the diagnosis of ALS. The, in the diagnosis of ALS, remember ALS is a clinical diagnosis. There is no specific test to diagnose ALS. Mainly the tests we perform are to rule out other causes of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron injury. We perform MRI, we perform nerve conduction studies, electromyography to rule out other causes. It's not, uh, there is no specific test to diagnose ALS. It's mainly the clinical examination and ruling out other disease that you make the diagnosis of ALS. Supporting investigations would be electromyography, nerve conduction studies to rule out gyan bray syndrome, to rule out any other damages to the nerves. After that, you make the diagnosis of ALS. Now coming to the treatment and management of ALS. Unfortunately, there is no specific curative treatment for ALS. We only have a few drugs that are shown to be slightly effective, but they are not very effective in treating ALS. These drugs only prolong life for two, three months. So the only drug that you need to remember for ALS because it is very important, commonly tested in exams. Whenever they have a question of ALS, they always ask you about riluzole. Riluzole is a sodium channel blocker. It decreases glutamate activity. Glutamate is, is, is an excitatory uh, neurotransmitter that is present in the brain. So what you want to do is that reduce the excitation since there is so much hyperactivity going on in the body. So it, uh, 50 milligram BD is given. Uh, that is the only treatment that we know so far for ALS. Other drugs that are being tested and are being used are Adaravone, Sodium Phenylbutyrate, but the main one that you need to remember is Riluzole. It's mainly a supportive care where you treat the symptoms of the patient and you comfort the patient. Spasticity, to reduce the spasticity, you use baclofen, a muscle relaxant. If the patient develops dyspnea, respiratory failure, you use non-invasive ventilation in these patients. To manage pain, you use analgesics. To manage mood, you use antidepressants. For nutrition, dietary modifications, soft diets are given. And in the later stages, when the patient cannot swallow food, there is a risk of aspiration. In that case, you go for PEG insertion in these patients. It's very important that you do regular pulmonary function tests. You check the FEV1 regularly to check the respiratory functions because these patients are at a high risk of respiratory arrest. You do swallowing evaluation uh, repeatedly to check the swallowing functions because if their swallowing function is impaired, they can have, they are at risk of choking and aspiration. And must do advanced care planning, talk about uh, what type of care do they want at the end of their life. It is an incurable disease. The median survival is usually three to five years, but few patients can survive very long. But majority of the cases, ALS has a poor prognosis. Before going into the summary, if you like my video, please click on the subscribe button and make sure to check out my other lectures on neurology, emergency medicine, ECG lectures. I have all those playlists on my channel as well as in the links given in the description below. We talked about what is Lewy Gehrig disease, upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron, both involve sort one mutation. Must remember that upper motor neuron and lower motor neurons that are involved bulbal palsy, lower motor neuron, pseudo bulbar, upper motor neuron. Then we talked about uh, how it spares the bowel, bladder, and sexual function and it spares the sensory pathways. That's why it's called motor neuron disease. It's a clinical diagnosis, and riluzole is the only drug that you need to remember for the treatment of ALS. Regular PFTs and monitoring of the patient should be done. It's an incurable disease. If you like my video, please click on the subscribe button and make sure to check out my lectures on other different topics. If you want to support this channel, you can always support us and buy me a coffee. Thank you very much.